windmills cause cancer. <laughs> That's what he said. And by the way, remember when he was trying to deal with COVID, he said, just inject a little bleach in your veins. <laughs> he missed it. All went to his hair. Said that. So fun. Hours from now, former President Trump will be sitting in a Manhattan courtroom as his hush money trial is set to resume. This, as the judge overseeing the case, has yet to rule if Trump violated his gag order. In Washington, D.C., the Supreme Court will hear oral arguments over Trump's claim that he is immune from criminal prosecution in the D.C. election interference case. Plus, Arizona's attorney general has charged Mark Meadows, Rudy Giuliani, and other key Trump allies, as well as 11 so-called fake electors with state crimes after they attempted to keep Trump in power following the 2020 election. I don't know. Did you see that coming? I did not. I didn't see that I coming. Really didn't. All right. Good morning and welcome to Morning Joe. Willie, did you see that coming? Not this one. I mean, we no. suspected it was coming sometime, but didn't see it coming yesterday. And some bold faced names, apparently, among the group of aides to Donald Trump Giuliani, yeah. Meadows, Eastman, uh, apparently all in trouble here in Arizona. Whew. Wow. It is Thursday, April 25th. It's great to have you with us, along with Joe Willie and me. We have U.S. Special Correspondent for BBC News, Caddy Kay, and Deputy Managing Editor for Politics at Politico, Sam Stein, is with us this morning. So, where do we begin? Um, baseball? <laughs> oh, no. Will Yankees win again last night? <laughs> we start night? in Arizona. That's <laughs> just and Soto. Is... Judge and Soto both went deep. I know you and Sam will be okay. excited to hear that, Joe. Well, we were very, we're very excited. I mean, the Red yeah. Sox now have like 17 or 18 people hurt on the roster. There was a pitcher who uh, picked up Sam a rosin bag, uh, and uh, his his, his, off. his arm, arm got dislocated. Oh, come exactly. on. No, we we have so many injuries, but these kids they keep calling up are. I mean, these pitchers that wouldn't start on any other team have the lowest ERA combined it's crazy. Uh, of any starting staff in baseball. It is kind of a crazy season. Oh yeah, no, it's nuts. Uh, I we were, we're like trotting out a triple A, maybe a double A lineup at this juncture. Had so many yep. injuries, and yet we keep you know chugging along. And you know, Alex Cora. Honestly, I don't know what magic don't he know works, he and it. it's going to be a real shame when the ownership doesn't bring them back because they're so cheap. <laughs> well, just uh, yeah, give you manager of the year right now, and Caddy, your your household can breathe a collective sigh of relief. Uh, our Liverpool uh, squad, my Liverpool squad, and I don't know. I guess I'm alone on this one. Uh, lost <laughs> yesterday to Everton. They're out of it. So our, I'm sure you had some happy Arsenal and Man City fans in yeah. your household yesterday. Yeah, afternoon. they are feeling good. I I don't really understand what is the antipathy between City fans and Liverpool fans. My husband, I'm so sorry about this, Joe, but Tom just, every time Liverpool loses, it's as good as when City wins. Well, yeah, it's the I same. Just think that it, seems same mean. at our house. Well, yeah. I mean, they're the, they're, they're the, two, they're the two best <laughs> teams in the Premier League person. over the past three or four years. Yeah, so it's crazy. But All they, right. You know, well, well Liverpool is very happy. They could. Make your husband uh, uh, gleeful uh, well, yesterday. All right. They are genuinely I'm, bad. I'm now. grateful. So, Willie, let's start with our top story in Arizona. Yeah, Arizona grand jury has indicted 11 of the so called fake electors, along with several other allies of Donald Trump, for their efforts to overturn the 2020 election. A 58 page indictment includes conspiracy, fraud, and forgery charges related to attempts by the defendants to change the election results in Donald Trump's favor. This was the scene on December 14th, 2020, when 11 oh people met at the Republican Party headquarters in Phoenix to sign a certificate claiming to be Arizona's 11 electors, oh, come despite on. Joe this Biden winning ridiculous. Arizona by nearly 11,000 votes. Proudly broadcasting it, by the way. The document also describes. What are describes, they thinking, Willie? I can't. I like, just what are can't. they thinking? It's such a cult. Like, okay, we are fraudulent electors. We there's a fraud scheme going on here. <laughs> Let's put the cameras on.
Maybe they're providing evidence. They were thinking ahead three and a half years down the road. They're going to really need this as Whoa. evidence. Here is us breaking the law. So the document, <laughs> the indictment, describes seven others in Trump's oh orbit who were God, indicted, so had their names redacted. Those aides include former White House oh Chief no. of Staff Mark Meadows, Rudy Giuliani, Jenna Ellis, John that Eastman, Bob. Christina Bob. Trump campaign official Boris Epstein and former campaign and White House official Mike Rowan. Roman. Trump was not charged, but is described as an unindicted co-conspirator one. The indictments mark a significant step forward in an investigation that has spanned more than a year. Here is Arizona's Attorney General, Chris Mays. I understand for some of you today didn't come fast enough, and I know I'll be criticized by others for conducting this investigation at all. But as I have stated before and will say here again today, I will not allow American democracy to be undermined. It's too important. Arizona now becomes the fourth state to file criminal charges against the so-called fake electors that sought to undermine President Biden's victory over Trump. Um, so, Joe, we saw the video there. They also signed a fake right. certificate that they posted to social media. I mean, they were breaking mm -hmm. the law, pretending they were the state's electors when they weren't because Joe Biden had won Jeez. narrowly bit one, broadcasting exactly what they were doing, and now the yeah. bill has come due. You know, I'm... I, I'm not a prosecutor. We have plenty of former prosecutors on, and we're going to bring them on in a minute. But, Willie, it's like, thank you so much for waiting until the day before the election. You know, I, I, all of these cases that were brought in 2020, late 2023, 2024, you know, look at the date there, December 14th, 2020. I, I really am, I, and I'm not certainly not uh, just pointing out this attorney general in Arizona. I could, I could bring it of of of, of all of them of, of the Justice Department. Why did they take so long? Georgia. We kept asking why Georgia was taking so long. Uh, Alvin Bragg said, "No, I don't want to bring that case," uh, and then brings a similar case like a year later. It goes on and on, but again. The timing, uh, first of all, it frustrates people who don't like Donald Trump because he's not How it works. If, is if, if there got were percent laws side. broken, it's okay. not going to get resolved before the, the election. And for people who support Donald Trump, they're like, look, they're all doing this in election year. So, again, I just, again, I know it takes a long time to build the I case. You, but when you look at what happened on January the 6th, it's kind of like, I don't. I, I just, I don't understand a four-year delay or a three-and-a-half-year delay on all of these cases. It's stupid. And uh, and I will say there were people, there were progressives warning about this, uh, legal legal people warning about this for the past couple of years. And, and here we are. Yeah, I mean, it's been a long time coming, and it seems uh, pretty clear-cut given the fact that we're just showing video of the crime being committed right here and Donald Trump here's, let's us, not hey, here's us breaking into the bank and a prosecutor's going okay <laughs> let people are in jail for January let's 6th. talk about this for four years and then maybe bring charges I'm sorry go ahead. instead of being the fake right. electors they called themselves the alternate electors we are an alternate slate that we believe that it should be used to count the votes. Remember, it was Tr President Trump at the time called the governor of, Doug, of Arizona, Doug Ducey, a Republican, to try to get him to flip the state's results as he was certifying them. And he famously ignored the call from Donald Trump and certified it for Joe Biden. Let's bring in MSNBC legal analyst Danny Savalos and former litigator and MSNBC legal correspondent Lisa Rubin. Good morning to you both. We can get to the timing of this in a minute, Lisa, but let's talk about the substance of it. So you have these 11 so-called fake electors, seven aides to Donald Trump, including Rudy Giuliani, Jenna Ellis, John Eastman, Mark Meadows, all those names we mentioned. Um, just for the benefit of our viewers, what exactly are these um, people accused of doing around the 2020 election? Well, the 11 fake electors are accused of forging documents, right, by signing an elector certificate and then sending it on to the Arizona Secretary of State, to the United States Senate, to the National Archives, which is what real electors do. They're facing three counts of forgery, but they're also facing counts that have to do with fraud, fraud in trying to 
sort of hold themselves out to be the legitimate electors. And of course, that's a scheme that they engineered with the help of the seven redacted individuals who, as you noted, include several Trump attorneys, but also Mark Meadows and uh, Mike Roman, who is the director of Election Day Operations. So, so Lisa, help me I, out here. It's help me all out right here. there. If I got a document here. And you video. And a video. And like. And, and, and they come in and they put their hands up and said, we did <laughs> it. I mean, that was in December of 28. And you've got them signing fraudulent what are we missing? documents. Why does it, and again, this sounds like I'm going after the Arizona Attorney General. I'm not. I'm merely saying what a lot of people have been saying for a couple of years. What's taking Merrick Garland so long? What's taking the Georgia uh, case so long? Why would it take them almost four years to turn around a case where you've got the video and the fraudulent document in December of 2020? So one possible explanation is that a number of states stood down on their own investigations because they expected the Department of Justice to charge some of these people. And when we ultimately saw that indictment against a single individual in the federal election interference case, it may have been that at that point a fire was lit under several states' attorneys general who said, well, wait a second, if they're not going to handle this, then I guess there's nothing else to do but for us to handle it. So that's one possibility. Yeah. Another possibility is that Makes they sense. needed things to come into the public domain and they needed cooperation. One of the things that's striking about this indictment vis-a-vis -vis some of the others is that it reeks of Ken Chesbro, who is unindicted co-conspirator force mm. involvement. There are multiple citations to emails involving Mr. Chesbro, but also others. And it's clear to me that this group of people in Arizona certainly benefited from all the investigations that went before it, whether it's the January 6th investigation run in Congress or even a civil litigation in Wisconsin through which public records now include emails from Jim Troopas, who was a Wisconsin attorney who worked with the campaign, or Ken Chesbro himself. A lot of those emails are quoted in this indictment, and that's what makes some of the other documents so damning. You know, fake electors could say, yeah. well, we were just doing this as a contingency plan, but here in this indictment, you see a quotation to an email that was sent on December 14th, basically saying, well, we got to hurry and rush and get this uh, lawsuit on file because that is intended to be cover for the fake electors. That is as transparent an admission as any that the dog was, I'm sorry, that the tail was wagging right. the dog here, right? Yeah. Well, Willie, um, so they, they were doing actually good legal work. They were rolling up other other witnesses uh, and could use Cheeseboro and others or Chesboro uh, others to help make this case more airtight. This, of course, proves um, that I probably shouldn't have read Hunter Thompson throughout law school, and maybe <laughs> I would be as smart as Lisa. No, I still wouldn't, mm. but maybe I'd figure that. Out. So there, that is an argument. I mean, just for people that say, why is it taking so long? Maybe they're building off of other cases. Yeah, I mean, they and clearly they swept up a ton of people um, in this indictment, including Christina Bob, who, let's yes. remember, she just a few weeks ago was named by the RNC to run the Election Integrity Committee. We'll just pause oh to think about oh that. Just a moment. Oh now she's a oh my God. indicted uh, in uh, this election he... scheme. So, um, Danny, yeah. want to ask about Donald Trump's role in all this and what trouble he potential could be in listed as unindicted co-conspirator number one. So he's not been indicted here. What does that mean? What are they saying about Donald Trump here? What's amazing is he's been an unindicted co-conspirator number one. His name was individual one several years ago when yeah. Michael Cohen came into federal court and pleaded guilty. So Donald Trump is no stranger to being an unindicted something who's named in a criminal document, whether it be an indictment, a complaint. So is this bad for Donald Trump? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, what we're seeing is that it's up to, when you talk about the several states, any county prosecutor could decide, hey, you know what, this affected our state, our, our county, the attorneys general can do the same thing. And, you know, going back to why so long, what was the delay all about, I, I totally agree with what Lisa said. I'd just like to add to it, I mean, it's no surprise that prosecutors were probably waiting around to see who was going to be the first to do it. Mm. Because it's scary. It's scary to indict a former president of the United States because he has and will fight like heck at every level. And 
losing a case, maybe one of the first cases against the former president, would be a crushing defeat. So in my view, from a social perspective, it was no surprise that in just the last year, once the first indictment came down, everyone else felt much more emboldened to start mm. indicting the president. Because, listen, I don't blame them. It's a scary prospect with just flaming disaster possibilities. So maybe we'll see more of it here. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, will hear arguments this morning in a historic case involving Donald Trump and his claim of absolute presidential immunity. Trump's legal team argues presidents have immunity from criminal prosecution for official acts taken while in office. Special counsel Jack Smith's office contends presidents are not above the law and that even if they're eligible for immunity for some official acts, Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election was not an official presidential act. Trump's immunity claim already has been rejected by two lower courts, and the special counsel argues justices should send the case back to U.S. District Judge Tanya Chutkin to begin that trial. Uh, Lisa, what do you expect to hear in court today? And do you, what we've heard so far is that perhaps these justices, even the conservative justices, are very skeptical of the idea that a president is immune from anything. I think what I'm looking for in terms of today's argument is to hear how much allowance certain of the justices might give to the idea that presidential immunity is appropriate in certain cases, and to listen to hear whether they're trying to make a decision that sort of reserves for themselves the right to make a broader ruling on presidential immunity at a later point in time. For example, they could say Trump is absolutely not immune based on the allegations of this indictment. Whether a former president can be criminally immune is something we would decide at a later date when the facts present itself. That's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is that Jack Smith's folks spend a lot of time on their heels in the back end of their reply brief, which is where they cover all the contingencies. I'll call it the even if section of their brief. If they end up in that territory for a lot of their argument, even if, for example, certain of these things are official acts, there are others that are not official acts. Even if he has immunity for official acts, we can still consider evidence of those official acts as part of the largely private conspiracy. Those kinds of arguments, if the justices drag them into that territory, you know that this is not not going to trial anytime soon. So, um, Sam Stein, let me read you uh, the, the, the lead uh, editorial in the Wall Street Journal today talking about uh, the Supreme Court must consider the presidency, not merely the fate of one former president. They write this, the burden on the justices will be finding a balance that recognizes the unique duties of the presidency while also holding presidents accountable for genuine law breaking. A president needs to be free to make controversial decisions without having to worry that he'll be prosecuted for them after he leaves office, but he shouldn't be free to commit crimes that are unrelated to the office. And then they go back to Nixon v. Fitzgerald, 1982, um, where the Supreme Court ruled that the president has absolute immunity from civil lawsuits for acts within the outer perimeter of his presidential duty. So that is the question here. Uh, did what Donald Trump do, if you're looking at Nixon, um, could you define what he did in and around January 6th as being in the outer perimeter of the presidency? Of course, for you or me, and I think most people watching would say, of course not. But that, that certainly is the question the Supreme Court has to be careful with, because again, whatever holding they, they come down with will be applied to future presidents as well. And we don't want every president leaving office uh, being indicted uh, by the, the, a, a hostile Justice Department. Yeah, I mean, I, this is obviously an extremely weighty case. Uh, even if it's uh, the designs to get it to the Supreme Court were not weighty at all. And by that, I mean it's very evident that the Trump's legal team wanted to do this just to throw sand in the gears and to delay their trial mm -hmm. until after the election. Now, as to the, the specifics, you know, Jack Smith's operation has been very clear. The stuff that happened on January 6th is inherently not about the acts of the presidency because Trump had lost. 
I mean, he had lost the election, and so therefore, it is not a presidential act, and therefore, he should not get immunity for it. Uh, whether the justices see it that way is a whole nother matter. Um, but look, I think this is pretty evident that what's happening here is that Trump's team wants to just muck things up. Uh, I, I don't think that there's anything more to it. They want to delay it. They want to get this out uh, from the election. And ideally, they want to see Trump win and then just dispense with the matter. Uh, but I think the, the journal's editorial, there's nothing inherently debatable or uh, you know objectionable about it of course presidents should have some level of immunity for acts they take in office the question is whether it should be blanket immunity i think in that front the vast majority of the legal profession is on one side saying no there should not be blanket immunity and muck things up of course is a very technical legal term that yes Sam has just yes given. Uh, <laughs> i studied law for many years <laughs> to come up with that term yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, and your money paid back, Sam. Well done. Good investment <laughs> on your yes. parents' part. Um, Danny, the, look, we see, we've got in real time, of course, a case where a former president of the United States is going through the American legal system and is being proved to not that, you know, the law is applicable to everybody. No man is above it. So let's go back up to New York. We've got David Pecker back uh, on the stand today. We haven't even got to the Stormy Daniels stuff yet. What are you looking for out of what have we got two more days of this week? What are you looking for? Look, I've said in the last few days, David Pecker may have emerged as really the people's star witness. We had a lot of focus on someone like Michael Cohen, but David Pecker is much better for the people for a number of reasons. Number one, he has some credibility issues, but not the credibility issues of a Michael Cohen. Number two, he starts at the beginning, and prosecutors love to take you through a chronological, uh, in the beginning, this was this relationship. And by showing this relationship where David Pecker had communication with Michael Cohen and, and I think this is critical, they've already shown that that communication with Michael Cohen went from once a month to once a quarter and it escalated. And what did it escalate corresponding to? The upcoming election. And that is going to be key to demonstrating that this was not a bunch of hush money payments to protect my family or my reputation right. with my wife. This was to influence the campaign. That's a key element that the people need to prove in order to aggravate this crime from misdemeanor to felony land. But as good as David Pecker was, and he's not finished yet, we may still hear some interesting things about his relationship with Donald Trump, which was longstanding. Uh, but David yeah. Pecker, why I think he may emerge as one of the most powerful witnesses for the people is another great reason is they called him first. That tells me that they wanted to start out with a bang and they wanted a witness that would be their best witness, if not close to their best. And also, lastly, who hasn't been riveted by the testimony of David Pecker so far? I have been fascinated to get a glimpse into the world of what he calls checkbook journalism. In the world of co yeah. uh, cooperating witnesses, I call David Pecker the scoundrel character. He's unabashed. He's unapologetic. This is what I do. It may seem sleazy to you, but that's who I am. And I think juries, not only do they tend to like this kind of witness, sometimes they even mm -hmm. laugh at him and find him entertaining. Well, and just like you and Drudge Headlines. As well, during David Pecker's I'll have to check the latest one. There have oh. been some good Pecker headlines on Drudge. Yeah. It's been pretty amusing but pecker back today and lisa rubin um the interesting point that i think danny was building on and i'm wondering what your thoughts are in terms of what you expect today is you saw in the pecker testimony um him really laying out plans for certain stories and even saying about a story that actually turned out not to be that uh, not to really have legs was uh, about the doorman and some baby that uh, illegitimate child and how he would wait until after the election to put that story out if he could get more on it, showing really that they were framing everything they were doing around the election. This had to do with, it had to do with the election. It wasn't yeah. to protect Donald Trump personally, like they were saying. Right. It was everything was timed for the election. Exactly. And so, Lisa, with that in mind, what are you looking for today? I'm looking for more evidence, Mika, of direct conversations between David Pecker and Donald Trump. He started with a direct conversation in August 2015 at Trump Tower. He ended the other day starting to talk about a phone call that they had in June 2016 when Trump called him up to say Michael Cohen had informed him about the allegations that Karen McDougal was making. And then Trump asked Pecker, 
What do you think? I want to hear more about that phone call. But also, not only did Pecker say that he talked to Cohen with increased regularity after the announcement of Trump's candidacy, he also talked to Trump with more regularity. So I'm looking to see what other conversations did David Pecker have with Donald Trump that bear on his knowledge and intent. That's critical to shoring up the flawed witness that Michael Cohen is and also giving him more credibility in the end. All right, former litigator and MSNBC legal correspondent Lisa Rubin, we will be hearing from you uh, and MSNBC legal analyst Danny Savalos as well. Thank you both very much for coming on this morning. All right, still ahead on Morning Joe, billions of dollars in USA now is finally on its way to war-torn Ukraine. We'll talk to the Washington Post's David Ignatius about how he says Ukraine can make the best of it. Plus, we'll go over the disastrous impact of the war on Russia. Also ahead, the mother of American Israeli hostage Hirsch Goldberg Poland will be our guest this morning following the release. Willie and I, uh, we had a rough day yesterday. I mean... Uh, it's a little known fact that when we escaped from I just just our hellish situation in Turkey. Okay. You we don't like to talk about this, but we escaped. We got some Turkish Arabian horses. We rode them to the border. We hung out in London for a while. It wasn't safe to come back to the United States at that time, right? And so somehow we got in with the stables of the Queen. This is a long buildup for this Wall Street <laughs> Journal yeah. the headline. Yeah. Uh, but we're in I'm, charge you I'm of you? caring for the King's horses. Uh. Before it was the Queen's forever, the King's horses. And we fell asleep on duty yesterday. Um, and some of the horses <laughs> broke free. Uh, and uh, these are... The king's horses That's a problem. running through the streets of London. It was for uh, his birthday. Uh, and uh, what can I say? Willie and I, I went to the dogs. Do we were betting the dog track. And um, Willie, um, you know, I guess you can, all you can say is I'm sorry. Right? Calls for our resignation, saying we're getting a little long in the tooth for the job anymore. There, this morning, I think we have live pictures. There are uh, protests in the streets of London. It's not yeah. pretty. They want us out, Joe. It's this tough. is now. This might okay. be the last straw. These are beautiful it's over. horses. They are beautiful horses. Okay, I hope they got them. <laughs> yeah, All right, I'm going them. to move on now with something actually that happened. President Biden yesterday signed the foreign aid Why? package passed by both the House and the Senate. And uh, it delivered billions of dollars in aid for Ukraine, Israel, and U.S. allies in the Indo-Pacific. In the next few hours, literally the few hours, we we're, we're going to begin sending in equipment to uh, Ukraine for air defense munitions, for artillery, for rocket systems, and armored vehicles. You know, this package is literally an investment, not only in Ukraine's security, but in Europe's security in our own security. We're sending Ukraine equipment from our own stockpiles. Then we'll replenish those stockpiles with new products made by American companies here in America. For months, while MAGA Republicans are blocking aid, Ukraine has been running out of artillery shells and ammunition. Meanwhile, Putin's friends keep giving him, keeping him well supplied. Iran sent him drones. North Korea has sent him ballistic missiles and artillery shells. China is providing components and know-how to boost Russia's defense production. With all the support, Russia has ramped up its airstrikes against Ukrainian cities and critical infrastructure, rained down munitions on you brave Ukrainians defending their homeland. And now, America is going to send Ukraine the supplies they need to keep them in the fight. But there's one thing this bill does not do, border security. You know, just this year, I proposed and negotiated and agreed to the strongest border security bill this country has ever, ever, ever seen. It was bipartisan. It should have been included in this bill. And I'm determined to get it done for the American people. You know, I was really fascinated. Lindsey Graham on the air, uh, or on the Senate floor a yeah, couple of days ago, said that they had a great border security bill, and unfortunately, Donald Trump uh, killed it. So I'm surprised he even dared to say that. Uh, so we agree with that. But I just want to say again, you know, President Biden, of course, has been a champion of this from the Ukraine. He's done an extraordinary job. But again, uh, we just, uh, I'm thankful uh, that, Sp that Speaker Johnson, uh, that Chairman McCall, 
that uh, Chairman Turner, the Chairman Rogers uh, in the House Republican caucus were such strong advocates of this because it's it's still shocking to me as a former Republican, still shocking. The majority of Republicans in the House voted against aid for Ukraine. Um, not so in the in the the Senate Republican Senate, thank goodness. Uh, so, but but there is there is a real split in the House, and unfortunately, the majority of Republicans in the House voted against. Um, well, I'll just put it this way: they they took Vladimir Putin's side in this battle. Uh, let's let's bring in right now uh, columnist and associate editor for the Washington Post, David Ignatius, staff writer at the Atlantic and Applebaum, and former reporter for the Wall Street Journal, Matthew Brzezinski. David, your latest piece in the Washington Post is entitled "How Ukraine." Can he make the best use of the U.S. aid package? Tell us, uh, how can they do it? So, uh, Joe, yesterday was a bad day for Vladimir Putin, no matter what, how you cut it. It was a good day for Biden, good day, as you say, for bipartisanship. But Ukraine is now, in a sense, Putin's forever war. We have said, the United States, with our, our European allies, that we are going to provide significant military assistance well through the, this year into next year. The, I think the key piece of new equipment that's going into Ukraine, we're already beginning to see the effects of it, are the long-range ATACM-300 missiles, which essentially put every Russian supply depot, command and control center, staging area, inside occupied Ukraine, inside all of Crimea, inside uh, the Donbass areas in the east, the strip along the coast, those are all at risk. And, and I hear uh, people in the White House beginning to speculate that the Russians will not be able to maintain the positions that they have there easily. They're going to have to pull their logistics deeper. And that's going to mean a different strategy in this war, one much more difficult for the Russians. So we were at a moment a few weeks ago when momentum clearly seemed to be on the Russian side. And I think most analysts, including Russians, uh, whose commentary I quoted in, in my piece yesterday, are now convinced that the momentum has shifted, that there's a big psychological boost for Ukraine. You know, Matthew, last time you were on, you were talking about the massive losses that Russia was uh, taking despite uh, the problems uh, on the battlefield. Uh, but but you, you, you've also written uh, that, that it has been a disaster, this war has been a disaster economically, demographically, politically, diplomatically, and strategically, and you lay out some, some really strong arguments why that's the case and why, it, it, as, as David Ignatius just said, it is now because of congressional support.